Welcome back to another episode of In the Eyes of Truth. And back with us for a second round is uh, Mikhail uh, Krupa. He's a historian, a political analyst out of Poland. To show you that Russians and Poles can get along and can live side by side and that we don't have to go to war. Uh, and... Absolutely. Well, hello there. Come hither, boys and girls, and hear the magical tale of the magic monetary theory. That's right. You no longer have to worry about all the pesky gold and silver to buy what you want. Just print, print, print. And when Marco Polo traveled to ancient China in the 1200s, the Mongol Khans of China showed him their magic monetary theory, where they had pure fiat paper money, and they could just print whatever they needed for whatever they wanted to buy. But alas, even that story had a dark ending. For the uh, magic monetary theory unleashed the twin beasts, the tidal wave of debt ridden by the beast of inflation. And when Marco Polo returned to China 20 years later, there were no Mongol Khans of China anymore. China had just gone through a vicious civil war that was sp sponsored by a total economic collapse. Let's fast forward 800 years. And a modern monetary theory is all the rage in the Western leadership. That's right. You no longer have to worry about debt. Debt no longer matters. No, just print, print, print all you need. But yet, the twin beasts are back. The tsunami of debt swallows up whole nations, causing the defaults, causing collapses in currency, destroying people, destroying their lives. The beast of inflation swallows up your hard-earned wealth. The products that cost $126 Back in 22, now costs well over $400 in 24. That's right, hyperinflation is here. What do you do to save your hard-earned wealth? Where do you go? You go to gold, not paper gold, physical gold. And you don't keep that gold in the United States, where in 1932, the government confiscated gold. It'll do it again. You don't keep it in Western Europe that's collapsing before our very eyes. Where do you go? What do you do? You come to ExitStrategy.World, the company that's going to help you find the safe haven for your gold and your well-being. ExitStrategy.World, the saviors in this dark fairy tale. While we're at it, did you hear uh, uh, Sarkozy? Cercos uh, Cer Sarkozy. No, not Sarkozy. Sarkozy is... Uh, uh, Sikorsky. Sikorsky. Thank you. I'm horrible with names. Sikorsky uh, had a little call from uh, yes. Poroshenko. <laughs> For some reason, they all love Poroshenko because the same guys do Poroshenko and they all want to talk to Poroshenko. I don't know why, because I mean he's just an oligarch with a sugar habit. Uh, he's not in power anymore. But apparently, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what do you say? Uh, go, go pound sand Ukraine as far as NATO is concerned. <laughs> Well, uh, it's great to see you again, Stas. Great to see your audience. Um, I was listening to that conversation for the better part of yesterday because obviously when I first heard of it, I said, nah, he really can't be that stupid, right? I mean, uh, our president got pranked by Vovan and Alexis twice. Once twice? they were uh, pretending to be UN Secretary General Guterres and the other time he thought he was talking to Macron. It's hilarious. <laughs> Forget about it. I thought this <laughs> time... no. I thought this time nobody else could get pranked because generally oh. Radek Sikorsky is the current uh, foreign minister of Poland. And you would think that before you get to the foreign minister, I mean, you have to have some layers of secretaries, somebody, you know, uh, I don't know, your chief of staff who handles these things. But it turns out that they got in pretty easily. I don't know how they do the voiceovers. I'm pretty sure they got the great techniques. But uh, the the narrative today was that it was some sort of a deep fake, that it was Russian propaganda, but, you know, nobody's asking the fundamental question, hey, did he say what he said? I mean, of course he did. Of course he did. Um, I watched the whole thing, and, and generally the uh, the message of this prank, and I thought it was brilliant, uh, I think I'm going to call Sikorsky one day, too. I don't know. I'm going to pretend maybe I'm Hillary Clinton or something, <laughs> but uh, uh, he's giving me ideas, these guys. But I, I love the sincerity of it because... It just goes to show that a lot of the crap that we're being sold in Poland in the mainstream media about how we're solidly behind Ukraine and so on, it's not true. I mean, he said things that we are not allowed to say in public in Poland because otherwise you will be called a Putin apologist. 
um, especially the, uh, the 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 moment where he mentioned that you know we in Poland we're not ready to send any troops we're not going to die the war is unpopular in general and uh, that interesting segment in the very beginning where he said that basically the aim of a lot of EU countries right now is to somehow apprehend the Ukrainian men that are in the EU countries and start sending them back as part of the, uh, what are they called? The Ukrainian Legion. Right. Um, so basically as cannon father, and he said something interesting. He said, because we don't want Ukrainians wandering about the EU looking for the best offer. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I'm against uh, Ukrainization of Poland also. I don't think a flood of refugees anywhere is going to help. But I mean, it does just goes to show, uh, I think our, our friend Scott Ritter mentioned it a couple of days ago on Danny Haifunk's channel that, hey, Ukrainians, the EU is not your friend. If you want a deal, you go to the Russians. You get the best deal you'll have because here you're only going to be cheap labor and you're going to be pushed around. Because flooding other countries with Ukrainians, it'll only generate friction. The same thing would happen if, I don't know, a million Poles all of a sudden settled into Ukraine. It's normal. But uh, we've been pushed into this situation. And the fact that Sikorsky put it in such blunt terms just goes to show the the, the amazing level of hypocrisy between uh, what they're saying in public and what they're saying now. And another aspect which I found interesting and I thought very sincere on the part of Mr. Uh, Applebaum, as some call him, because obviously his wife is Ann Applebaum. So we don't know sometimes whether he's more Sikorsky or he's more Applebaum. Um, but he said one interesting thing that when, when, when Poroshenko asked him, uh, so what does the opposition of Poland think? What does Duda think? What does law and justice think? And he said, oh, on Ukraine, we see eye to eye. There's no difference, which again goes to show that the establishment in Poland has no foreign policy. Yeah. It's a uniparty foreign policy dictated by the American embassy, um, and nothing in that regard changes. So if we want real change in Poland, uh, to all our Polish listeners out there, we have to dump Tusk, and we have yep. to dump Kaczynski politically. Get yep. them the hell away from any levers of power. You know, what I'm, and I understand their attempt, uh, they, they picked up this Macron ambiguity. I'm going to say mm -hmm. everything to everyone so nobody understands where I really stand. But the only problem with ambiguity is you can stumble into a war pretty easily that way because the other side really doesn't know what you want. And if they're starting to suspect that you want war, it can lead to war, even when you don't want war. And the Americans are going to be more than happy to push Poland in the meat grinder. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if I can understand Richard Nixon making the case for the madman theory because this was a man, uh, the head of a superpower that could right. destroy the world, Russia. And everybody 10 times over and obviously get destroyed itself. But I mean, if Poland is playing the unpredictability gang and I mean, trying to act as a tough guy in Eastern Europe, I mean, with all due respect to my beloved country, sorry, guys, we, we just don't have it. <laughs> we, we just can't sell it. I'm sorry. It doesn't work with Poland. I mean, uh, this is a big boys league. Uh, we should be happy we're in the medium sort of league and we should stay there because that's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Hungary is profiting fairly well. Yeah. Slovakia at the same time. Uh don't, you know, uh, bat over the league that you're in, I, I would say. So uh, it's a lot of tough talk, but I think that most of the conversation that Sikorsky was engaged in that in that phone call was pretty sincere because, as I said, you know, he uh, he, he said things. I mean, it's, it's the best form of open source intelligence. Just prank these guys, literally, because they'll tell you things that... You, so you actually said that. Wow, you, can you, you don't have to repeat that. You actually said that. By the way, we just recorded it. Um... So yeah, it's uh, but but you do get a sense though uh, w when you when you listen to him, and I think I'm pretty good at spotting uh, body language that even him and his pals in the current uh, liberal left government in Poland are, are really tired of this war. They would like it to go away. Um, so I hope I hope that one of the things because I always get asked this question in international interviews and even in Polish interviews, what would happen if Trump were to come to power? regarding Poland. And I would say, well, if Trump indeed does advance his peace plan with J.D. Vance, um, that would at least force Poland to find some sort of modus vivendi with Russia and stop this warmongering, because we'd be forced into it. I mean, if we don't have the backing of Washington and the backing of Brussels, which is an extension of Washington, by the way, right, right. Uh, then we yeah. can't do anything. Which is a good thing because it gives us an opening to at least, you know, calm things down with Moscow and provides for an opening for, you know, uh, possibly in the future if somebody normal comes to power in Poland to do a basically Nixon goes to China moment and finally 
uh, do a breakthrough in our relations and not only make them more uh, stable, more predictable, but more friendly. You know, I was uh, one time I was on uh, the show for uh, Bowen and uh, uh, Lexus. Yeah, I, Lexus. Yeah, I keep. Yeah. I won't keep saying Mercedes for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but um, yeah, I was on their show because they, they do a show, right? Okay. Uh, and they go through their little, pr the, the pranks that they've done and people comment and discuss it. Um, and I asked them after, I was like, how do you get these guys to open up? I'm like, yeah. we don't know. We just talk to them and they just tell us everything, <laughs> which which kills me because you think, yeah. I mean, at the level they're hitting, there'd have to be a vetting process before they just, here, there's a phone call for you. We have no idea who he is. He's Perpichanko. Or yep. shake us constantly on the phone. But yeah, apparently either A, there's no vetting process, or B, these guys really want to get the truth off their chests to somebody. Possibly. I mean, I but even if but if you look at the uh, you know the Eurasian telephone lines, I think it'd be pretty hard for me to call Xi Jinping, for example. <laughs> I think it'd be pretty hard for yeah. me to call Vladimir Putin, even Medvedev for somebody, you know, some some I don't know, Volodin, for example, from 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 the uh from the Duma. I mean it's these things should not happen. You should have some sort of intermediary between you as a VIP, right? I mean, the, the, the process itself is is really fascinating. And the way they open up, I mean, you know, I, I like to prank people also. I mean, I think I'm good sometimes at imitating voices, but uh, I mean... I can't do French. <laughs> the, 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 the fact that you hear so much that, okay, yeah. this guy got pranked by somebody calling Poroshenko. This guy got pranked. So the first thing that you should have in your mind is when I hear somebody calling me, telling me he's Petro Poroshenko... Uh, let me check this out first. But no, these. But it just goes to show the imbec imbecility of the current Western elites, and yeah, it's I, tragic because yeah, these yeah. people run our lives. They have nuclear codes. Um, they could do really stupid things. And I mean, it's just literally, it's as if uh, Arkham Prison was opened up on Gotham City oh. and the clowns yeah. take over, right? And there's no oh, Batman yeah. to save us. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I love the way you. I mean, you, you're so right as far as the imbecility. I can't, you know, when we were growing up, the people that were the leaders of Europe, those Schroders, right, uh, the, the Margaret Thatchers, I cannot imagine them getting pranked like that. No. It, and it, opening it's... up, yeah, let me tell you everything, because <laughs> here, somebody just told me you're per, per, Petro Poroshenko. I, I just can't imagine those people, especially when it has happened so many times. It's constantly. It's a, I mean, they're hitting these guys once a week. Mm -hmm. Somebody. Yeah, yeah, and I'm pretty sure they've already done a couple of which they haven't published yet. So I think oh, some good sure. ones are coming out. I mean, if they prank Duda for the third time, it's going to be literally. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's going to be L M A O, if you know what I mean. No, really? Uh, because this I, time I, I am Petro Poroshenko. <laughs> literally, literally, because I think. Um, because yeah, I think he's the only head of state that was pranked by them twice, and I mean. And it's funny because when he got pranked the second time by so-called Macron, the guy who was the head of his office uh, was uh, dismissed, and now he's serving as a Polish ambassador in China. Uh, so he, he got sent away. I wouldn't send him to China. I'd send him, I don't know, to, uh, to, to Antarctica, but it is what it is. The question is, is that a promotion or is that a devotion? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? I, I, I don't understand. a bad location. I, I I checked his competence when it comes to China. He doesn't seem to have any, but whatever. It, it's the Polish Foreign Ministry. It's you know more more question marks than answers, unfortunately. Oh uh, yeah, that's. But you know, with not only because, because I've always had this question, you know, considering, okay, fine, a, a percentage of Poles despise Russians for various historical reasons, and we've had reasons to despise each other. And we've had sure. a rough history. If we want to keep living in the past, uh, fine. Okay, I can understand that somehow. But when these same people support a state that puts the likes of Bandera, whose people butchered 250,000 Poles, cut the babies out of mother's wounds, took, took little children and strapped them with barbed wire to trees and let them, uh, left them out at night to freeze to death, I mean the the mass. I mean this isn't just killing. This is well, let's torture and get the best photos. And then they photographed everything. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. I think it's a Nazi thing. I don't know what it is. Photograph your victims. I guess I don't know what you go home after the war. Here, kids, look what ah daddy did fun on his trip. 
<laughs> what did you do in the Great World War II, right? As Patton oh, said. look. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't understand he, he, these people. But, but the fact I, I think it, it would be better to be shoveling shit in Alabama, right, than doing the things yeah. that the Nazis did. Just, just to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And, and what, what I'm getting at is, you know, okay, Z never mind Zelensky's nationality, which kills me when Jews are fighting for uh, Bandera. Yep, yep. Uh, but, okay, that's a whole different issue. But uh, Bandera is now the father of Ukraine. He's been elevated. The Ukrainian Army Day is the founding day of Una Unza. Yep. And you have Polish politicians knowing all that, knowing the history, and they're kissing ass. Yeah. Uh, Poles, the, the entire sort of uh, philosophical uh, uh, logic of the foreign policy of the Third Republic after 1989, and it, it sort of manifested itself in different degrees, but it was always there somehow. And it was always obviously goaded by the Americans. I mean, the entire point of entering NATO was to get back at the Russians because the Russians might invade us. It, it, it was all set up with regards to, we don't want to go back to the East. You know, when, when we were entering the European Union, uh, there was this uh, famous motto going around, either we enter the European Union or we become like Belarus. Well, looking right now, you know, the highways in Belarus, how Minsk is clean, it's an orderly yeah. country. It's like, yeah. I wouldn't mind being Belarus right now. But anyways, uh, I digress. There is a segment of Polish society, unfortunately, highly educated within the elites, with international connections, that thrives on always the latent Russophobia in Poland, that somehow states that, yeah, you know, the Ukrainians did what they did, but they tend to relativize it uh, oftentimes where they say that, but the but what the Russians did was 10 times worse. That's one way of explaining it. The other explanation is, yeah, but the Ukrainians had their reasons. That's sort of like saying Hitler had his reasons, but th those things are really in the narrative. And, and the third explanation, th there's even a third explanation going around that if you really look into it, Bandera was a Soviet agent, and he was doing the bidding of the Soviets at the end of the day. So if you combine those three, um, that explains a lot of what at least the people on TV are saying. Now, if you go down to the grassroots level, most people who survived Volinia, there's actually a pretty good documentary being uh, made right now by uh, one Jacek Menlar. It's based, I think it's a two-part documentary. It's basically conversations that he as a film producer is having with the last living uh, witnesses of the Volhynia massacre. So he wants to gather all their accounts and he's putting them into one film. The things that they are saying, I mean, you know, apocalypse now, the worst scenes at the end are, are nothing compared to what happened in Volhynia. Oh, yeah. You know, it's but the archival it's, photos. It's, I mean, the are insane. It's, it's, it's hell on earth, literally. And yeah. it, it's good that he's doing it because, you know, uh, People should understand that even what happened in Katyn Forest, I'm not obviously excusing what happened in Katyn Forest, but was more humane than what those bastards did to those innocent people, right? I mean, a bullet in the head and you're dead and not cutting up women. Not, I mean, we all know the story, right? So, so as I said, it's those three versions of events that, you know, Bandera was somehow a Soviet spy, that the Ukrainians had the reasons and the third, that uh, that what the, that yeah, Bandera was bad, but Stalin was worse. If you combine those, plus with the hefty support of Washington that uses Polish Russophobia as a willing uh, enabler of stupid foreign policy, then you get the combination that we have. Now, the the only thing that might change that perception, and we're already seeing the change come about, um, is the fact that. The amount of Ukrainians that are coming to Poland, the costs that we are incurring during this war, they're already becoming unbearable to a lot of people. And for example, the Polish attitude towards Ukrainian refugees, or unfortunately so-called refugees, there's a lot of them too, uh, has changed dramatically since February 2022. And now we're just looking right now on the political scene for any party or any presidential candidate who will take up their mantle and say, hey, this is Poland or this is Ukro Poland. We want to remain Polish. And the only way for us to remain Polish is to make sure that most of these Ukrainians go back to a, a, a viable Ukraine, and that means stopping the war. So you have to connect those dots at the end of the day. 
Um, so yeah, it's it, I, I get that question a lot, Stas. Believe me, how can you polls support that? And I'm disgusted just as you, but the level of hypocrisy and illogic that is present in the Polish mainstream debate leads to such conclusions as the ones I just presented to you. I even had a book in my hand a few years ago uh, that basically tried to prove that Bandera was in essence a, a sort of extension of, he was a Russian agent. He was NKVD, the Soviets were, were using him. It's it's yeah. that kind of pseudo-analysis. Especially when we sit in Auschwitz uh, in the guest quarters a portion of Auschwitz. People don't understand. Auschwitz was like three or four camps. And there was yeah. a camp for political prisoners that are going to get recycled and used again. So they had apartments and they just had an easy living. <laughs> so, yeah. You, you know, I, I'll... I'll give you i'll say one thing uh and and this is it will be touchy for some people um i disagree with the narrative of uh catlin forest and i'll tell mm -hmm. you why two reasons uh and one of them is very uh, personal uh first of all uh people forget that the soviet union in 1942 put up uh, on its feet the first polish army yeah uh and that so this is what three divisions and they had full contingency of generals to warrant officers. So if all these officers have been executed, where the hell do they get all these officers, right? Second of all, my own grandfather, who was a captain in uh, Polish uh, horse cavalry, who was a German mm -hmm. Pole, he spent a year in a uh, POW camp in the Urals. Uh, and this he was nationality German, mm -hmm. Polish citizenship, one year in a POW camp, and then he joined the Red Army. Mm -hmm. So he didn't get executed. He mm -hmm. said there were there one else, and, and they even took him into the Red Army, uh, where uh, he served to the end. Well, he was a surgeon, so he served at uh, a, a combat sur well, a combat surgeon. Well, they 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 followed the front. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then he stayed in the Soviet Union afterwards. Uh, mar married my grandmother, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So if, if, ever, if all the officers were being executed, and him show, especially him being a German mm -hmm. on top of that. You know, you'd think uh, that would happen. And so for those two reasons, and there's also, there were also, um, uh, at least I've read, I, I can't, I never saw it myself, obviously, mm -hmm. but in uh, Goering's uh, notes that mm -hmm. they had a panic because in uh, in uh, the mass graves, they found uh, there was uncovered a certain amount of uh, Luger uh, casings. Mm -hmm, Lugers mm -hmm. are pretty r relatively rare to get ammunition, so you couldn't really find a lot of Luger ammunition mm -hmm. before that. They weren't using the Soviet Union, so for mm -hmm. those reasons. No, I, I I admire your right to 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 hold that opinion and to, to free speech. Obviously, uh, I think it's it's a discussion that we can have on another uh, on another occasion. I wasn't ready for that, but uh, oh no, no problem. I, I wasn't planning on that direction either. I, I think at least the the position of uh, the Russian Federation at this time is because re remember 2010, right? When that plane yeah. crash occurred with Kaczynski, oh, yeah. Vladimir Putin did come. He, he did at least as the head of state acknowledge uh, the fact that, uh, that the, that the orders were given that the, that those officers were shot. It's, it's basically a question of who managed to survive and who didn't land in Katyn. Because for example, you know, they say about the second corps of general Anders who, uh, who fought at Monte Cassino, Mm -hmm. These guys, they left Russia, they went through Tehran, they went through Northern Africa, and then they left, and then they ended up in Italy, and they went to Bologna and up north. And they always said that the, the Polish officers who went with, uh, geez, what was his name? Uh, the Kostushka army that went in the north and went towards Berlin with General Jaruzelski of later mm -hmm. fame, obviously, these guys were the ones, they always say in Polish circles, the ones who didn't make it to Anders because the new army that was formed was on the basis of an, an agreement between then still living General Sikorsky Vladislav and Soviet, uh, what's his name? I think it was Minister Maisky. Mm -hmm. So it was like the Maisky sikorsky agreement that allowed them to formulate a new army. But I have no doubt that the, the fact of the Katyn massacre did take place, that it was conducted by the, by the NKVD, uh, the controversies between uh, I have I haven't read that that Gehring account where where he talks mm -hmm. about the panic, so I haven't looked into that. I'm not an expert in that field, but uh, I know for sure that on on the level of state sort of agreements that Putin at least, and at that time even Kaczynski, because when his plane crashed, uh, nobody took uh, pains to read the 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 speech that he didn't speak at Katyn because he was dead. 
But I read that speech after, and it was a very conciliatory speech. For for Kaczynski to say the words that he did at that time, that was pretty actually surprising because it would seem that in light of the then announced so-called reset by the Obama administration, Kaczynski sort of felt where the wind was blowing, and he sort of extended an olive branch, at least a half olive branch to the Russians. Whether he was doing it sincerely or not is a different question, but for Kaczynski to have spoken those words, which he didn't speak, was actually pretty profound. So... As I said, I mean, everybody has the right to their yeah. to their opinion, but I think there's so much to build on anyway uh, that, you know, as I said, we can't be living in the past the whole time. There's a future and a present, future hopefully that our children will enjoy and a present that we don't want to end, as uh, <laughs> Condoleezza Oops. Rice once said. Yeah. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud, so... Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, well, I think some people do, uh, and, and they, they don't understand... Uh, you know, um, but but you're absolutely right uh, about uh, what, what happened uh, uh, as far as uh, the wreck. Which, which, by the way, I never understood how he put the entire government on one plane. Which is idiot. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I when I worked at Halliburton, they wouldn't allow more than two vice presidents to fly on a commercial plane. And this is a corporation, and here's an entire yeah. government sitting on on one plane. Oh, literally, insane, it, it would which is... it, it it would literally be the equivalent of putting the entire White House and the national security staff, plus a couple couple of cabinet members, a couple of principals, so to say, uh, on one airplane. It was literally that dumb. And when you look at the uh, the negotiations that took place before the crash, it's it just goes to show the. Uh, how petty Polish politics can be because it was actually two visits because before Kaczynski flew on the 10th of April, 2010, a few days before him, Tusk flew as the prime minister. Now, in a sense, we can say that was proper because the prime minister and the president were not on the same plane. But I think it would have been more proper if the prime minister and the president flew on the same day, just on two separate planes. Right, Plus, if you consider right. the fact that uh, Tusk had better weather conditions when he was flying uh, in his Tupolev, uh, it might not have ended as tragically as it did. I mean, it was, I couldn't believe it also at first. I mean, okay, you put the president, but you might want to separate the head of your national security bureau, put him on a, on a different plane or even on a train to go to small. Right? right, right, right. So it's, as I said, uh, you know, we're going back to what we said in the beginning with the madman theory. We're batting not in our league. We want to be tough guys. It's the Polish Hussar mentality, you know, absolute, you know, we're the Hussars here, we're the Romantics. But uh, sometimes you got to calm that Polish spirit down and say, guys, let's get back to earth. Let's do things a little bit more slowly. Let's think through some things and not try, not try to score cheap political points with every move, especially on the international arena, because not only does it make us look foolish oftentimes, but unfortunately ends tragically like it did in, uh, in Smolensk. I'd say it doesn't just make it look foolish. It uh, allows Poland to be used as a proxy. Yeah, yeah, literally. I mean, I mean, literally. But, you know, as we're going to that, uh, mm -hmm. with the politicians up, uh, upholding Banderistan, I don't yeah. know how else to call it, but there's a new monument that went up in Poland. And you were there, as, as far as I uh, remember. Yep, you yep. Tell and, us about the uh, monument. So and there's a, nice a huge monument. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's powerful. The monument itself, the history of it was uh, the sculptor, the guy who created it. It was actually created, if I'm not mistaken, a decade or so back. Oh, but because no. of political correctness, uh, no township in Poland, no official government agency, no ministry didn't want to take it in oh. because they thought it was too brutal. Because you, uh, well, <laughs> everybody, if they saw the, uh, just Google basically uh Volhynia massacres uh mm -hmm. monument in Poland in Domostava the village of Domostava um so when they find when the township of Domostava or I think the county of Domostava finally reached out to the uh the the sculptor's name is Pitinski Andrzej Pitinski they reached out to him and they said listen okay we're willing to put it up uh, on our in our township bring it over here they finally assembled it uh there were thousands upon thousands of poles that congregated that day um what's interesting uh, the prime minister didn't show up. Uh, the foreign minister didn't show up. The president didn't show up. Uh, some news agencies carried news about it, but generally in a sort of uh, in a narrative. Why now? I mean, the Ukrainians are fighting for their lives. They're fighting for independence. As a matter of fact, 
I think it was the head of the Ukrainian minority in Poland who said, and he should have got slapped for this, because he said, um, this is an example of Polish stupidity, which will only be used by Russian propaganda. Uh, oh, nice, nice. The, the, the <laughs> fact that that guy didn't have, you know, he didn't get his face trashed for saying something like that. And th this is a Polish citizen, by the way, who's oh, representing really? the Ukrainian minority, but he has a Polish passport. So, but as I said, it, it's good that they were finally commemorated. Nobody can ignore this uh, monument anymore. It stands basically along one of Poland's most busiest highways uh, in, in, in southeastern Poland. Uh, thankfully, no acts of vandalism have been recorded thus far. <laughs> But uh, with the amount of uh, Bandera loyalists in Poland we have right now, we can't uh, discount that. But I think they, they, they've managed to install some security cameras around there and and sensors. So, yeah, it, it, it was a big thing because if you consider the history of this monument, uh, you know, in a country that suffered so much at the hands of Ukrainian nationalists, you would think that not only should it have a prominent place in the Polish capital in Warsaw, but such a ceremony should be attended by, uh, you know, the prime minister, the president. But they just showed, literally, they just showed uh, where their loyalties lie. So that that's a sad state of affairs, unfortunately. And for people who don't understand, so the the, the monument is the Polish uh, eagle. Uh, yeah. The wings are written the the towns and the, the, of the massacre locations. In the middle is is cut out. And there's the body of a child propped up on the three, uh, the Triton, the uh, the Ukrainian yeah. Triton that, that's piercing the body. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's uh, that, that cannot have <laughs> made it's the vivid. Yep. happy to see that go up <laughs> literally. And, and it was meant to be vivid, so uh, you yeah. know, that, that, that was that was the point to, to, to show what who we're commemorating here and what methods were used to uh, to kill. Uh, and that oh, was yeah. just one of the many creative methods of the uh, banders. So I'm happy it's up. Um, and I'm hoping a lot of also people who come to Poland, who travel that highway, uh, tourists will make a stop and ask the right questions and get to know it. Because this history, unfortunately, is not as widely known as many of the other rightly commemorated crimes during World War II. But this one definitely needs to have a breakthrough in the consciousness, especially of uh, of Western Europeans. Yeah, the Banderites uh, murdered about a million and a half people. Uh, so they they murdered. And that's not even counting uh, uh, SS uh, Legion Galicia. Yep, SS, SS Galicia. Legion Galicia really got its ass kicked in one battle with the uh, Red Army, and then they became concentration camp guards. No, it's funny. That. Also, a, a lot of the Polish patriots who like to commemorate, unfortunately, what I consider to be. Uh, an example of useless national suicide, which was the Warsaw Uprising. That's obviously that we can have a different discussion upon. But we every every year on the first of August, all of Poland stands for one minute at five p.m. to commemorate so-called Godzina Vu, so the hour W when the Home Army rose up against the Germans in Warsaw. Um, but you know, it's hilarious because nobody ever discussed the fact right now. Well, some historians made points about this, but the liquidators of the Warsaw uprising that were used by the Germans in the first instance were Ukrainians who basically went into Warsaw and basically killed off civilians to be, yeah, you know, just to do a sort of a Basra times 10. You just go in and you liquidate everything. The Ukrainian soldiers in this regard, uh, the proxies literally of the Germans were very eager in doing Yeah. So yeah, the the it, it's a it's a very it's a very powerful uh, statue, and it's a uh, it's a very interesting fact about uh, you know that the home army. And you know, today, as a matter of fact, today, uh, what we've we've started doing uh, in Russia in general is opening up a lot of old archives, a mm -hmm. lot of stuff that was archived for various reasons under secret classification by the Soviet Union. It should have been opened. 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were, for example, a lot of stuff about what the Banderites did was secreted away because the Soviet Union would promote the friendship of people and, you know, yep. and okay, we're all living mm -hmm. in the same country now. So, yep. okay, we're going to put this away. We don't need to put this in the history books because that'll just breed uh, hatred. But it should have been because it whitewashed away. The Soviet Union whitewashed away a lot of what the Nazi proxies did. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things they, uh, that came up, uh, one of two interesting things, uh, and I've, I've seen the document for the second one, uh, 
Uh, the first one was that the uh, Red Army actually flew in support of the Home Army because it's always accused the whole the Red Army did nothing to support the Home Army. They just sat there watched them get uh, destroyed. Well, the Red Army at the same time was fighting destroying Army Group Center, but they flew yeah. seven thousand sorties, so individual plane sorties, uh, br dropping supplies over uh, Warsaw. The, the main, the, the main problem with the decision of. Uh, and Stalin obviously gets a lot of flack for not helping the Warsaw uprising. But first of all, if he, the, the, when uh, when London, when the Polish government in exile decided to execute uh, the operation of the Warsaw uprising, what was the plan? The plan was basically to weaken the Germans and pave the way for the Soviets to come in. But the assumption that Stalin would go along with the Polish plans, whatever other Stalin's motives were, was not confirmed. It was basically an assumption that we're going to heroically fight, the, ergo, therefore, we're going to get help from the outside that will allow us to, uh, to achieve our strategic goal of, you know, uh, forcing the Germans to leave Warsaw. But they got no such guarantees from Moscow, no, either for strategic reasons, for ambitions reasons. I, I don't know personally. Um, but the fact is, the most compelling case for me that this was a suicide mission was the fact that they did not get any confirmation from the other side that once you guys start the fighting on the streets of Warsaw, we, i.e. the Red Army, from the other side of the Vistula, we're going to come and help you. I know of no such confirmation before the decision was taken. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong. Uh, I, I'm just... I've been reading upon the sort of alternative literature on the Warsaw uprising in the last couple of months, so I'm still have some things to, to make up, but um, Norman Davis obviously is not the only authority on this issue. There, there's a couple of good books, especially by Professor, the late Professor Vyacherkevich and Jan Chehanovsky from the 70s about the Warsaw Uprising, where they go into detail on a lot of these things. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, General Anders himself, the great General Anders of the Second Corps, he believed the Warsaw Uprising to be pure stupidity. Another Polish general, I think it might have been Sosnowski, who was uh, the chief commander in London, I think it was after after the order was given, uh, told somebody that in essence, when the soldier gets a, an order, he's to fight. We have nothing against the soldiers, but the commanders all should have been shot dead for sending them to their deaths. Yeah. Uh, and the political and the political yeah. minds who decided about this. And if you consider that, you know, 200,000 people died in the Warsaw Uprising, the entire city was destroyed, literally leveled. What did we achieve at the end of the day? Nothing. Total ruin. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of uh, fact-based claims in Poland that a lot of the elite flower of Warsaw City before the war went to their graves, and that's why Warsaw is such a liberal and crappy city these days, <laughs> because the real Varsovians, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. you know, they died in the Warsaw Uprising. Died heroically, but died for a useless cause, unfortunately. Um, and Hitler, once he got word of the Warsaw Uprising. I mean, he was very adamant. He said, kill everybody. Level the entire city, women, children, everybody has to be killed. Um, so I'm, you know, unfortunately, the Warsaw Uprising in Poland has risen to the level of a so-called, as a former friend of mine called it, suicide Disneyland. They celebrate it. They sing songs. It was such a beautiful cause and so on and so on. I had the chance once when I was still a history student at the Catholic University of Lublin we had a professor, Vishniewski. He's uh, dead for a few years right now, but he was uh, he was one of the uh, mm, he was in the Home Army in the Warsaw Uprising. He told us every single time, "You do not want to live the hell that we lived in Warsaw for those couple of months in 1944, living in sewers, having rats running all over you, running from place to place, seeing your friends getting blown up in front of you, women, children, blood all over the place." He says. He he's seen hell. He's seen hell literally. He was a very good man, a very very solid Christian Catholic, and the the, the way that he would tell us this with 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 his hands shaking, always uh, sort of forced me in a way to look at the so-called celebrations because there's really nothing to celebrate. We should mourn on that day uh, to make it a cheerful holiday. I think it, it, it's yeah. just sickening. It sort of reminds me of. You know, during, I think it was Bull Run or several battles during the Civil War, 
when people would congregate on the battlefield and have picnics. Go oh, it's going to be so go much wrong. fun. There's going to be a yeah. battle, right? I mean, <laughs> it's the exact same thing, right? On a level 10 times worse than the 19th century. So, and a lot of Polish patriots are waking up to that fact. As a matter of fact, our friend Radoslav Sikorski, about who we talked today, he is of the same opinion that the Warsaw Uprising was was suicide, basically. And he takes yeah. a lot of flack for it because of that opinion. But at least on that score, we we see eye to eye. Well, if you, if you look at it, the Red Army uh, was busy. Well, it, it was exhausted after literally destroying Army Group Center. I mean, yeah. you're talking a, about a third of the German army was destroyed. And not just the German army. The pan-European army was destroyed in Minsk. Uh, I mean, well, Belarus and the swamps and all that area. Yeah. So by the time they get to the uh, Vastula, Vastula is not a small river. Now, no, by no means. To, to be able to, uh, to, to reach the city, you may be on the other side of it, but you've got to cross that river. You have to force that river. You have the German army, the, 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 the Germans have retreated, what's left of them, plus the uh, reinforcements that have a strong base on that river. It was crossed. It was crossed the next spring. But I mean, by that point, you get the men are there. They've suffered massive losses. They're under strength. They're exhausted. Equipment's down. It has to be repaired. And to start a mass uh, attempt across the river. The second, the first Polish army was, as a matter of fact, sitting across from Warsaw mm -hmm, also. Mm -hmm, and they mm -hmm. didn't move either. They None of them were able to move at this point. You know, throwing a, throwing a supplies on a, off of a plane, that's about the most they could do. Maybe artillery uh, fire across the, the river. But forcing a river against, I mean, a forced crossing of a river against an entrenched enemy is one of the hardest things you can do. That's it, why the need for the knowledge of operational art, strategic art is so important, as our friend Andre Martianov likes to point out and laugh when he talks about Western thinking of the military. I think if you factor in that every historian who respects himself commenting on such events that are not only political in nature, but also military in nature, without the background of at least or a semblance of knowledge of the operational art, the doctrine of a certain army of the Wehrmacht, the Red Army. It's easy to make statements saying, oh, you know, the Russians didn't help us. It was all a gamble and so on. Well, it, history usually is not that <laughs> so easily explained. Right. I mean, it, it's not a cartoon, right? It's not a cartoon. And um, it, it's a battle of interest. It's a battle of operational art. It's a battle of saving as much people as you can. And it, and it's also, you have to consider the fact that, you know, we were in the tragic position as Poles that despite the fact that we thought that we were the most important uh, aspect of World War II and in the world, we forgot that not, no, every single country, even the enemy had its interests. The advancing Soviets had their interests. The British had their interests. The Americans, the Allies, uh, the French and the Germans. So thinking that all of a sudden the entire world, because that was the premise of a lot of what happened in 44, was that once the world sees how we bloody ourselves, then they will say, okay, we have to rescue those Poles, right? And that's the thinking that continues to uh, prevail in Polish mentality, which has its roots sort of in the 19th century when Adam Mickiewicz called Poland in a blasphemous way, unfortunately, but he said, Poland is the Christ of the world. That we we are the sacrifice that everybody has to look at and say, oh God, those poles are dark. <laughs> now we have to help them, and that unfortunately is is also the premise of a lot of Polish thinking about the West. That the West this time they will not betray us. This they time. betrayed us a hundred times. <laughs> they will not betray us hundred and one for sure. Not not this time. So so when Napoleon was retreating out of Moscow, <clears throat> and the Polish uh, legion that was like forty thousand that left Poland, well left the, uh, the, the, the the kingdom of Poland, was what's left of them was being used as the uh, rear guard for the yeah. French to get across, and the, and the French and the German, uh, uh, the German mix to get across the rivers while the Poles stood and died in place. Yeah. And, that was a and it's a, That was being, and you it, know, that, and it's ironic. And, the glory. and it's ironic because we celebrate that little French squirt in our uh, national anthem, when we sing "Dał nam przykład Bonaparte, jak zwyciężać mamy," that's why, as a conservative, as a proto-monarchist, I believe the Polish national anthem should be the uh, hymn to the Blessed Virgin Mary, which we sang when we destroyed the Teutonic Knights in 1410 at the Battle of Grunewald. The hymn is called Bogurodzica or Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in that battle, 
Uh, one of the participants on the Polish-Lithuanian side was the great, 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 great grandfather of your own, Dmitry Rogozin, who <laughs> always tells his children that you got elements of Polish blood in you, and don't ever be ashamed of it. Well, it, it's um, Bogorodica in, in Russian, so it's uh, Bogorodica, exactly. Slavic, yeah. And I, I told you before, I, I've got uh, from my mother's side, I've got some uh, Polish blood from uh, the last monarchy. Uh, from a side family. Hallelujah. So. Yeah, we're, we're well, all you, you, now, now when I look at you, Stas, you sort of do look like our last Polish king. Hmm, there might be some dynastic lineage here. I'll be calling you when, I'll, when we'll be needing uh, uh, a successor on the throne. That might take some time, but uh, expect yeah. a call. <laughs> Yeah, Applebaum would probably be standing there. Uh, oh, I, I, Applebaum would be persona non grata by then, you know, or she'll be cleaning my shoes or something. So, uh, <laughs> or and Radic woman, will be delivering my pizza. <laughs> that woman, oh geez, she needs to get a new hobby. But I love that T-shirt. Let everybody see that T-shirt. Uh, it's it's my sentiment for the uh, great Southern Confederacy and uh, the great heroes. I will never be ashamed of General Lee. And uh, I think one of the great successes of American cinema were actually the good films about the uh, the Confederacy. It's part of the American heritage. I have a lot of respect for them. And uh, I always like to say it wasn't just about the slavery. There was a lot of factors that came oh, into that. It was hardly about so. the slavery. Son, the South will rise again because the South shall rise again. Amen, There's brother. that Amen. damn Yankees can do about it. Amen. Yeehaw. Yeah, I, I lived half my life in the South, so uh, second uh, homeland. And I've got a General Lee mug, but but by the way, you can't. I don't think you can buy those anymore. Even America has gotten but, uh, so whacked. Uh, I, I, I don't think I, I th sell them there anymore. I think they'll be censoring the Dukes of Hazard uh, soon because the Dukes of Hazard, obviously, they had that famous car with called General Lee, right? I mean, it was such a pro Southern uh, TV series. But right now, I mean, if you're knocking down statues and you're basically trying to race an entire uh heritage of what constituted the united states for a long time um then you know it's uh yeah you're, you're erasing your own history it's sort of like in poland where we're running around and we're uh we're destroying any sort of uh you know monuments uh tributes to soviet soldiers that liberated poland for example it's i said you guys you think you're conservative when you're doing that but you're doing the exact same thing as the mobs and blm in the states yep. you're trying to erase history it doesn't work that way people will always remember history it was tragic, yes, but you can't erase it. Leave it alone. Let people think about it. Let people ponder about it. And let's have enough humility, as Eisenhower once said, when people asked him what he thought of General Lee. That was a very profound statement, what Eisenhower talked about General Lee, how he considered him to be an American, a patriot, a courageous soldier, a gentleman. Uh, you know, things that I hope maybe one day... Uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians will be able to say, I hope not into the distant future when all this, when all these shenanigans end and, you know, NATO goes bye-bye and we bye. Slavs are, ab are able to live in peace finally. You know, I, we're almost out of time, but I, I'm going to say something that unfortunately is, is going to bring sadness into your heart. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, and this was, about, I guess, 25 years ago. Yeah, uh, I was driving uh, with some friends to go uh, spelunking uh, mm -hmm. up in uh, Tennessee, right? Okay. So we crossed over the North Carolina border into Tennessee, and we're going through the mountains. And we saw this store, the General Lee, uh, lots of General Lee cars, and a big convention going on. Mm -hmm. So on the way back, it was still going on somewhat, so we stopped off. Uh, and the guy that uh, played Scooter, uh, the mechanic, mm -hmm. he owned that place, right? So he retired mm -hmm. there, and mm -hmm. he'd have a convention every so often. <clears throat> and all the, oh, it's all rednecks up in the mountains. <laughs> so he'll do yeah. it. <laughs> and they're all standing in line because Daisy Duke was signing uh, autographs. Wow. And here's the uh, painful part. You remember yeah. Daisy Duke in those Daisy yes. Duke shorts? Yes. Yeah, they wouldn't fit one leg on her. But uh, she had a behind about that wide. <laughs> like, well, you ain't Daisy Duke, right? <laughs> I mean, what, what the hell? 
because it, you know, and I it's, watched that when I was a kid, and oh, they said, yeah. it. It's, no, no, no. It, it, it's evolution. It's evolution. I was once in love with uh, Sarah Connor from Terminator 2. Then I saw Linda oh. Hamilton in the latest installment, the crappy installment of Terminator. Yeah. And I was shocked. I mean, this is you. This is you. No, no. I'm going to go back to the earlier Linda Hamilton. But uh, yeah, it's it's evolution. <laughs> evolution. Well, I guess yeah. uh, Daisy Duke, you know, once you got all that good meat down south, uh, that's all you're eating, then, you know, you're going to have consequences. But at least she Ooh. stayed true to her colors in a way. So <laughs> kudos to that. <laughs> it, it was scary. It, it was it was like one of those childhood memories. You just the the dream has been broken, shattered. Yeah. Yes, I can never look at her again like that. You know, it's like oh no, no. I know what became of you forty years later. You know, <laughs> oh, it was horrible, 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 horrible. So, and on that note, <laughs> yes, on that very sympathetic note, <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we will definitely have. Uh, Kale back with us, uh, hopefully sooner than uh, this time. Uh, understand the, the family issues, uh, and I, I'm not gonna publish it. It's uh, it's up to you. If, if all you right, all to right, start. no yeah, problem. Say anything more we all have it. them once in a while. Yeah, it's it's part of life. So, anyways, everybody, thank you, thank you for joining us, uh, and we will be back. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. <laughs>